have we received any any question yet okay cool uh huh yes yes that i'm i'm coming to that question um so just quickly wrapping up what i was saying that there are these multiple kinds of geographical areas and there are different kinds of conflicts there um and one of the um one of the play, what one of the things that the event was um uh, highlighting is that we find the incidence of torture and extrajudicial killing specifically in areas where there are special laws extraordinary laws like the afspa or the um public disturbances act in andhra and chatisgarh and various other places uh, and in kashmir now so so this question um sort of comes there we we see uh, of course in places which have been characterized as um, as as a conflict zone where we are saying that there is a lot of terrorism so to speak we have special laws which have uh, mandated and given sanction both uh, legal and social sanction to the use of torture and extrajudicial killing and that is a fact now we do not have any statistics on um torture but there are civil society um people have put together so for example in amnesty did a study amnesty international did a study on um the the incidence of torture between 1985 to 91 which is 6 years and they found that there were 451 cases of torture leading to to death now this is not talking of torture which does not lead to death similarly the asian center for human rights did a study on the use of torture between 2001 and 2011 and it found that uh, we have 1504 cases of torture now compare that to the national crime records bureau's own statistics which in this period between 2001 to 11 talk about 20000 uh, 12000 deaths in judicial custody so if one um, sort of looks at the statistics of torture that we have in 10 years we have 1500 cases or in 6 years we have 450 cases by any stretch of imagination we will know that this is a very little very small number torture is sort of a reality no matter where we live whether we live in the cities or in semi urban spaces or in villages or even in delhi uh torture is very much part of our investigative reality so this number um does represent what i was pointing out very initially that the that there is no way of knowing the amount of cases of torture or there is no way of knowing uh, actually having data around it this this is one of the points we were pointing out at the uh, that the, we do not have a law we do not have uh, official recording of cases of torture and the other instances were that there were a few um torture cases that took place we had i don't know many many of you might have heard about the bhopal uh, torture case which took place after the encounter um recently uh we 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 what did we do uh when we hear about um that that case of torture so we 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 got to know that there were about 21 accused in bhopal um uh bhopal central prison um that were being um they were they were accused in terrorism cases and they were um being tortured both by the jail superintendent and with the collusion of the jail doctor now at that time we thought that there is no point of taking to this case to court of course if the very definition of torture says that you have to there there needs to be a certain official that tortures you for a certain reason and in india we know with the section 197 that if you are accusing any official of any 
wrong incident, you need permission from the central government, which of course never comes. So in this case, we documented the torture. Um, we met the some of the victim families and we just tried to find out what is it that they are saying? What is it that the that the jail administration is saying? Just recorded these two versions and based based on these two versions, we could see that there is some incident that has definitely taken place. So we petitioned the National Human Rights Commission uh, to investigate. At that time, the National Human Rights Commission appointed had appointed a prisons monitor uh, who was still right there, Maya Daruwala, uh, who had worked with policing um, for a long time now. So um, Maya Daruwala, we, we approached Maya Daruwala, um, who works with us closely, and we asked her to intervene in this case and also petition the National Human Rights Commission. So the National Human Rights Commission um, sent an investigative team to the Bhopal prison uh, for a fact finding on the question. The fact finding found that there was torture, that there was incidents of serious torture in the prison and recommended the uh, prosecution of jail officials uh, who participated in the, to in the torture and also the, the, um, the medical doctor presiding in the, in the prison. This was one of the only reports, I would say, across, um, across our country, which very clearly indicted the prison officials for torture. Anyhow, so that was one of the, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the background to the uh, UN Human Rights Council intervention, where Mr. Ashwini Kumar was there, and also the special reporter uh, on torture, Mr. Nils Melser. And when we were pointing these things out during uh, the Human Rights Council session, the problem of ratification, India is not ratified, we have been continuing the practice of torture, it has become a norm. We find its incidences much more in situations of what have been classified as conflict. Um, and I remember that there was a Chinese person who, um, who asked this question precisely that somebody uh, just asked that why should we not use torture against people who are terrorists? And I remember that uh, that the special rapporteur took this question and he said that killers, no matter where they are, deserve to be punished. Whether they should be tortured or not, is an ethical question, which actually talks about us and not about, so how we, how we, sorry? Yeah. Now, can torture be um, be used against terrorists um, is a good question, and this this leads us into the um, specifically into extrajudicial killings as well. So, the special rapporteur on torture. I don't know how many of you know, but the special rapporteur is like an independent expert um, appointed by the UN on specific themes like torture, extrajudicial killing minority rights or um, counterterrorism and human rights. And uh, when he said uh, to the to the Chinese person, because uh, in the UN there is there is there is one more thing um, like in everywhere else. People who raise human rights voices are largely small NGOs, but there has been a new trend of something what we call gongos, government funded or government NGOs who are um, who just come to the Human Rights Council and take advantage of its uh, processes and there they put out voices which belong to the state and not to the to from the point of view of human rights so gongos are quite a phenomena now uh, at the UN and some some of some of these questions also come 
uh, come from there. So I was wondering how is, is the special rapporteur sort of going to answer that? And he took it to an ethical plane and he said that, of course, when you kill anybody, for example, a terrorist who bombs or indiscriminately kills civilians in public or whoever, an individual, by killing, they forfeit their right to live. And hence, they can be subjected to torture or to, um, on the fact that they kill, they, 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 they need to be subjected to extraordinary forms of violence. So, now I want to focus on extraordinary forms of violence, which is extrajudicial killing. It is called extrajudicial killing because the state and its forces kill a citizen in ways that is not mandated by law. That is principally extrajudicial killing. Over uh, in India, we have had a long history of extrajudicial killing, especially in Andhra Pradesh. And if you look at the jurisprudence, uh, and I have a few stories around um, K.J. Kannabiran. I don't know how many of you know about him. Um, this is a very, this is a very one way um, sort of a sort of a discourse. I'm not used to it. This is one of my first time. I'm more used to talking to people in hall or a classroom, and there you get some feedback and you speak to the people. Um, but here, this is a slightly disorienting. So I would ask you to bear with me. Um, I, I, it feels like I'm speaking to an empty room, uh, but uh, there are more than a hundred people. So sorry about the some of the disconnections, but killings by the state. Let's let's look at um, um, let's look at a, a brief overview of the history of um, of killings. I think most recently you must have heard the that encounter killings were very popular in the state of Uttar Pradesh, and um, the 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 executive was pursuing it as a policy rather than as uh, an extrajudicial uh, element of things. It was part of state policy. And according to the um, UP state government's own, um, what Mr. Adityanath said uh, in the assembly, is that there were more than 3,200 encounters that took place in the state of UP between March 2017 and June 2019. So in, in two years, 3,200 3, encounters. But not all of them led to death. 78 deaths. Out of 3,200 encounters, there were 78 deaths. And the, many were, there were more than 1,000 injuries and this and that. But confirmed deaths by the state's own officials are 80 people. And we looked into um, some of these encounters also took place in the state of Jharkhand um, at that time, Zaribagh and some of, the, some of the places. And we looked into, did fact findings into these encounter killings. Uh, we found that largely the the demography of people who were killed were either Muslims or Dalits, which which just says that much that out of the eighty people, these were the main people who were killed. Similarly, there are statistics about the one of the most serious sites of extrajudicial killing, which is the northeast, and. Please understand that I am not talking about party politics here. I'm, these are two issues that lead us into the nature of the state. The state is there, which has its executive, the judiciary, uh, the legislature and many things. Many parties come and go. People occupy these positions, then people go out. It is a whole very circular way in which it is linked to the rest of the citizens. But right now I'm not talking of party politics because I think as law students, most of you I think are law students, you would know um, uh, that both torture and extrajudicial killing lead us into in areas of law that tell us that this is really about the state and the state of exception that we levy through law. This is not about the policy of any one party, but the state throughout modern nation states have always used direct violence in the form of extrajudicial killing 
indirect violence in various other forms, enforced disappearance, um, um, torture, and, well, let's not get into direct or indirect, has used, states have always used extraordinary violence to, um, to let me just put the word right now, to instrument, instrumentalize. I will explain it a bit later. When the British, this may be a good time to sort of enter into Birsa Munda. I briefly looked up what the whole, who, who is Birsa Munda? What was he doing? Why was he such a pain for in the, let's just say, such a pain in the ass for the British? Um, more than 120 years back, when the British took over, this we are talking about the period early, uh, late 1800s, uh, between 1875 and 1900. And this was a very critical time where the British were consolidating land. Land was the central question. All Most of our forests have always been, especially where there are indigenous people, forests have been regulated in the same way that states regulate citizenship and land, the indigenous idea of regulating forest have always been the idea of commons, of shared. And that is a very different idea from what the British were trying to institute. Because the British were coming in, it was a colonial uh, rule, and the very basis of a colonial rule is that I will come here and I will take certain things. Now, the British said, OK, we are the masters of India. These forests belong to us. And how do they forests belong to us? Of course, we will take something for them. We want, for example, whatever it, it means by when we say tax. We want tax from it. In order to take something, in order to take tax, they need to institute a special kind of relationship. A relationship where the idea is that this particular forest or this land collectively belongs to some idea or some entity called the nation or whoever is the ruler. And of course, as it belongs to the ruler and there are certain people living in it, they need to pay tax. Now, Birsa Munda never had this idea of his own forest. He thought that this forest is mine because I have been living here for thousands of years and I will be living here for thousands of years. So who do I need to pay tax to? And why should I? Birsa Munda, even though he was so young, he died when he was 25. Between when he was 17 and 25, we see the prime of his activity. And he realizes, much more so than all the people around him, that as soon as the British will want this relationship to be instituted, this extractive relationship, even now, and I think throughout modern nation states, their relationship with forests have been principally been extractive. I will take something from that. We've never asked the forests. Of course, how do we ask them? But what Birsa Munda realized is that this change in his relationship with his forest, his relationship with his forest could be divine, could be spiritual, could be about a river that flows, could be, it, it is many things. It's about this land where he grew his crops or had his fruit trees. The land had not turned into a commodity. The land was what fruits came out from it, what river flowed in it. It was a different relationship with the land. The British wanted to institute a different relationship with the land, where Birsa Munda was a riot, the, the, the Rayatwari system, where he was there in the forest and he needs to give part of the produce to the British. So this land relation has been central. What, 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 what Birsa Munda revolted against was this change in agrarian relation. And it is precisely when you see that there is a challenge to the system on its very principles, on the very principles, economic, social or political principles, whether you attack 
institutions of the state. Let's say if you attack the judiciary, you will be held in contempt. If you attack somebody else, so politically it's a different thing. Socially, a modern nation, a modern democratic secular nation state has a certain social order. If you attack that order, you will be considered a terrorist. If you attack the political order, if you attack one of the political institutions, the symbols, the flag, you will be considered a terrorist. Terrorism is doesn't mean anything. Terrorism is the creation of terror, and terror is an emotion. It is not a concept. It is not rooted in facts. It is purely an emotional idea. The state feels terrorized when its fundamental principles are challenged. Whether through violence or not, it doesn't matter. What Birsa Munda, when he refused to accept the particular kind of agrarian relation that the colonial imperial government was instituting in his forest, he said that I am not going to accept that. And his very existence then was a revolt, which is where I come back to the term of instrumentalization. We have many scholars pointing out that law or certain kinds of law, and we know the state of exceptions. For example, we can say Kashmir is in a state of exception. Manipur is in a state of exception. We have central India, wherever there are nexus or whoever the shit it is, it's a state of exception. They are terrorists. And hence, we need these special laws which do not entirely conform to rule of law procedures. You can kill, for example, in ASPA, you can kill if you have, if, if, that, if the police officer or the law enforcement officer or the army officer feels there is a threat that, and feels that in the pursuance of law and order, he can shoot or she can shoot, then he can without accountability. And that is impunity. And all anti-terror laws, all states of exceptions, institute a certain level of impunity, which is where torture and extrajudicial killing as methods come in. So what is instrumentalization? Now, I would like you to think in terms of, you are a citizen, you have a state, and you have a certain relation. It is based on a social contract. You say, okay, I will give up certain rights. I will not kill. I will not lie. I will not do any criminal activity. I will not do anything civil that is wrong. In exchange for the fact that nobody will do this to me. The fundamental contractual basis of modern states is that. And once we have entered the contract, if we violate the contract, the police comes in, the force comes in. The state uses force to institute the rule of law. But if you don't do anything wrong, you are a free citizen. Nobody, your existence is not subjected to somebody. Your existence is there for you to work, for you to eat, for you to have your pleasures, for you to have what the labor movement has done. You have your five days a week work. And what the feminist movement is doing that you cannot beat up your wife at home, even if you are not working. So your body, you are the sovereign. You can use your body and your mind in the pursuit of the things you want. That is a non-instrumentalized body. But the free flow of power instrumentalizes bodies. It means that it subjects those bodies Principally, first and foremost, towards a certain end. When you torture somebody, what are you doing exactly? You are saying that, okay, give me this information or else I will subject you to extraordinary pain, even death. Which means your very existence is dependent on the fact whether I receive this information or not. That is a body that has been instrumentalized by power. Its sovereignty has been lowered. It has been subjected. It doesn't exist independent of my right to have that information. This is principally the relation that used to exist in slavery. 
This is also principally the relation that exists in the Nazi camp, where Jews were subjected to extraordinary power just because they were Jews. This is also the relation that is the colony, whether it's the Indian colony or the Tunisian colony or any colony. The very idea of the colony is that this land and this region is subjected to my will. Its people don't exist independently outside of my will and power. Which is precisely what anti-terror laws do. Which is why they are called extraordinary laws. Which is why it's called a state of exception. Because when you, in a region, when you allow the police to fire on the basis of suspicion, without having the necessity to offer proof for that firing, for that killing, you have created the necessary condition for the use of violence indiscriminately. And as soon as you do that, you have subjected, the, you have started the instrumentalization of that region, of that people, of that whatever. Because the rule of law doesn't entirely exist. Now this is precisely the situation that was existing when Birsa Munda was there. When the British said that, okay, you have to pay tax, you have to give this money. He said, no, 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 we have our own systems of doing these things. We have our customary laws. We have a way of talking. We have a way of eating food together. We have a way of sharing the forest produce. We have a way of deciding who grazes where, which plants, what happens, how much is grazed, because the indigenous relation with the land was never extractive. It was cohabilitative. But the modern relation is extractive. And Birsa Munda could realize that the British want to, want to institute this extractive relationship and he revolted. And the British didn't like that. Of course, because this was a colony. Because even though there was a rule of law, even though there were these many of these acts, even though there was many of these things, people could be killed and people could be tortured. And this is what happened to him when he went to prison. And there are many accounts of how exactly he died, but there is no doubt that he died in prison and the prison is the fundamental space of power of the colonial state with all its mechanisms of torture, of violence. So, getting into, uh, into this idea of understanding power as instituted in law, which is why I am constantly saying that I am talking of state. When you look at power as a long term, Let's just move away from immediate happenings. Let's just move away. I mean, uh, party political, everyday, five-year, ten-year things, they, they may not be so important. Or at least for this discussion. Because we're looking at ourselves. We're trying to answer questions of ethics. When we say, can we kill terrorists? When we say, uh, can there be death penalty? Can there be torture? We are talking of questions that concern humanity throughout space and time. We are not talking in any particular local socio-political context. We are also talking in these contexts. Which is why it's necessary to look at the larger question of forms of power and what laws do, what they don't do. Living in Jharkhand, in the forested regions, living in plains or living in the hills, you would have different ideas of the appreciation of law. Now I want to, um, yeah, the Birsa Munda died in prison. He was neither the first one nor the last to have died in prison, whether killed extrajudicially, through torture or in any way. But whenever the modern state has felt challenged to its very principles, social, political or legal, it has resorted to extraordinary power, power which is unaccountable, unchecked. This is the power that we see in torture. This is the power that we see in extrajudicial killing. And you see it coming up. That is why it comes up in conflict zones. You say, okay, this is a conflict zone. This is war. And we have these very famous, um, that everything is fair in love and war. Well, that's why we say it. 
You say, because if it's war, we're not going to abide by any rules. So, of course, if there's a war in the Northeast, then you can kill indiscriminately. If there's a war, let's say, between India and Pakistan about Kashmir, then you can do whatever the shit you want. If there's a war because there are some people, some Naxals picking up guns uh, and trying to change the system, then, of course, all the people, whether they, whether they or anybody around it, they all deserve to die. One could say that. And nobody at the end of the day can tell you whether you're right or wrong. Because these are principles, these are ethics, and it's a matter of positions. States have always used extraordinary power, unchecked power, for uh, whenever they have been challenged. So if Birsa Munda was opposing a particular kind of institution of land relation, the first time the relationship of the indigenous with his or her forest was being changed, Munda revolted. Now you see, we've, we've 120 years into, after Munda revolted, you, you see that he died, of course, because the overwhelming force was on one side. There's nothing you could do. And now 100 years of, of, of relation, even though the Forest Rights Act has come, in many ways, over the last 100 years, in India, the state has managed to institute an extractive relationship with the forest, whether through certain laws or, or illegal activities or whatever, to extract coal, to extract this, to extract that, for whatever reasons. But now, and especially in the last 20 years, as you see in the Narmada Bachao Antolan, or if you see in many of the anti-dam movements, or in many of the anti, in, in what is happening in Orissa, and in Chhattisgarh and in Jharkhand, you see that this is also the time where once land has, where the state has claimed the right to the forest, of course, just by claiming the right to the forest, its purpose is not served. Its purpose gets served when it can extract something. And now we realize that extraction is an economic relation. And we have these large multinationals coming in. Whether it's multinationals or our own people, when I say multinational corporations, I don't mean foreigners. Because corporations are kinds of legal entities. They have a certain way of functioning, whether they are by our own people or outside people, it doesn't matter. Because it's a kind of extractive relationship. A corporation means the existence of a certain kind of money relation. So once the forests have been claimed, now it needs to be distributed, it needs to provide access to mining, to many different kinds of things, the extraction of resource. And similarly, like it was in Munda's time, we also have a different kind of, of opposition to it. And you see that the instrument that was being used at, at, at the time of Munda, extrajudicial killing and torture, is pretty much the same even now when dealing with opposition to the fundamental relation of the modern state which is extrajudicial killings and torture whether in kashmir whether in central india whether in northeast whether anywhere else within the punjab so after this sort of theoretical um introduction i i just want to quickly go over um how many encounters, or I mean, only in India this is known as encounter, police encounter. The rest of the world calls it extrajudicial killing. There's a report that between 1968 and 1999, 30 years, there were 2,000 encounters in the state of Andhra Pradesh. The National Human Rights Commission was formed in 1993. Between 1993 and 2009, it registered 1,262 complaints of extrajudicial killing, of which it found only 11 to have some substance that actually there was a killing. All the rest of the 1,250, it found uh, that it, these were false claims. This is just to illustrate the use of extrajudicial killing. Why Andhra, I think most of you would know, because that's where the, in the 1970s and the 80s, it was the hotbed of, uh, 
of a different kind of uh, of, our, of an argument of a different kind of land relation, whether you call it nexalism, Maoism, or um, indigenous uh, revolts, it's 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 up to you, and it would reveal more about you than about the things itself. So, extrajudicial killing is the is is a direct form of killing that the state uses, especially when it is challenged. Now, this killing is, one could argue, very similar to any killing, because killing is killing. This is what the terrorists do. They kill. Which is why we say that, of course, when you kill, you lose your right to, uh, to, your, to use your right to have rights. That is why the state can go ahead and give you a death penalty, which is the, not the extrajudicial, but the judicial way of taking away life. I would not see any killing as morally higher or lesser. Or in certain situations one could, but killings are killings. Now the state can kill directly. But the state, and we have the numbers of direct killings. In Manipur itself, we have about 3,000, estimates are about 3,000 encounters in the last 20, 20 25 years. In uh, Andhra Pradesh, we have a similar number, 3,000 to 4,000. In Central India, we have much more. In Kashmir, we have much more. Even by any estimate, I would say that we have 10,000, at least 10,000 killings, extrajudicial killings, over since independence. At least, I mean, this is really a false number, but let's just say 10,000. Compare that to the deaths of uh, the deaths caused by terrorism. I calculated, I, I, I study terrorism and I calculated um, the deaths caused to civilians in India and it comes to around 1200 to 1300. You put all the major blasts together and that's what it would be. Communal riots have claimed much more uh, lives. In fact, if you calculate the deaths caused by traffic incidents across the country over the last whatever time, you will find that it has killed much more than what terrorists have. Which is where the question of structural violence comes in. And you see structural violence also in large sort of situations when we're talking of genocide or we're talking of crimes against humanity or war crimes. There is a certain category in law of structural violence. And that is creating the conditions. For example, we had in the, uh, during the British time, we had these massive uh, droughts and starvation, which killed millions. The Bengal famine, the this, that. The legal conditions of Rayatwari that was put into by the British uh, or whatever kind of system that they put in led to the direct starvation of so many. This is structural violence. It is murder when thousands are allowed to starve or forced into a situation where they cannot do anything but starve to death. Similarly, but now I'm taking a slightly a step, a step higher, when we stand by and watch a lynching we are also creating in person the structural conditions for that act to take place. And if you will follow what is happening in the US right now, the killing of George Floyd, the two officers who were standing behind, how are they being looked at? Of course, they are also being looked at in an accusatory form. Because the knee on the neck was not the only thing that led to George Floyd's death. And I, I was yesterday hearing a uh, uh, congressman, uh, I forget the name right now, but one of the oldest, sort of like, I mean, not, not like our Mahatma Gandhi, but let's say, imagine if you had one of these freedom fighters who was still alive. He's really old and he was part of the civil rights movement and he was part of the whole Afro-American movement in um, the, the fight for black rights. And he yesterday was standing in a podium and, and, he, and, and Barack Obama is his follower, considers him mentor. 
sort of like a Martin Luther King in a different form, the American Martin Luther King or the American Gandhi. And he says that it was not just the, the knee on the neck, it is many other things that led to George Floyd's death. And this is what we call structural violence. Now, um, there is a small incident um, here that I would like to narrate to answer that question of terrorism as well. So, I, I, when the emergency was instituted in 75, which many of you as law students might be, might be knowing, the, the very emergency was a state of exception, that certain laws will be not be applicable, that your right to have judicial remedy can also cease to exist. We have, um, we have now, the emergency seems to be coming up in many discussions in India today and must be for some reason. But the emergency is that when you, when you, when, when all the different, different institutions of the state do not function in their accountability to each other in the protection of the system, in the protection of rights of citizens. So emergency, there was a lot of, and of course, in, 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 in a state of exception, extrajudicial killings and torture will thoroughly increase because there is no rule of law. And there was a lot of encounters that took place in, in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, after the emergency was instituted, uh, was, was over, Jai Prakash Narayan instituted the, uh, what is called the, um, um, there was a civil rights committee that was um, headed by VM Tarkunde uh, to investigate into the encounter killings in Andhra Pradesh in the 13 months of the emergency. And the Tarkunde um, committee gave two reports and found that there were massive instances of extrajudicial killings. Based on these two reports, the government then, um, the JP government at that time, instituted something called the Bhargava Commission, headed by an ex-Supreme Court justice, to put it on paper. What is it that these encounters were about and what did they do? When the Bhargava Commission went to Andhra Pradesh, especially Medak district, uh, before they were, they, were, they were supposed to arrive, there was this one encounter of four young boys between 18 and 22 years who were murdered by the, by the police in Andhra Pradesh under the emergency in the Public Disturbances Act that was there and there was no accountability, of course. So KG Karnabiran, who was a civil liberties lawyer based out of Hyderabad, uh, got a call that um, there is this encounter that took place of these four boys and the police seem to be intimidating the witnesses who have been thinking of deposing before the Bhargava Commission. So Kanabiran immediately took a car and went to City Paint, which is about three hours away from Hyderabad. And there he, um, because it was a traditional village and people used to gather in a certain space in the, in the middle of the village, and he just sat there and started talking to the villagers. But it was all quiet because everybody was afraid the police had just come and left. Slowly people started coming in and he started chit-chatting, drinking tea with them. And then he asked them what actually happened in the encounter. It turned out that these four young boys were killed because they had stabbed a local moneylender. Now this is again agrarian relations. We're talking of Medak, largely agricultural relations, part of the forested regions to some extent. And here is a moneylender who, uh, I don't know, caste class location, but Basically, through the use of money, people were very angry. Lands had been taken away because he used to lend money and then give alcohol. And this, some of you might be aware of this extractive moneylender situation. So moneylenders can be terribly hated. And moneylenders have always been part of the modern system, not just in India. If, if you've read uh, Crime and Punishment, uh, if you've read Dostoevsky, uh, his principal novel is about uh, a moneylender. He goes and kills a moneylender. So moneylenders have always been at the forefront of the state. When this modern state has been expanding into unknown areas, into forests, into seas, one of the first people that go there are moneylenders. So there is more to it. So 
these four guys had stabbed a money lender. So then Kannabiran said to these villagers that, you know, because these guys stabbed a money lender, what is wrong with the police having killed them? Now, this is exactly the same question that somebody just asked. And I get asked at various places. What is wrong with, with killing somebody who has killed? And Kanabiran says, he writes that, he documents that, that when he asked that question, there was a half-naked shepherd. These are his words, half-naked shepherd. Basically to imply a very poor person who's never seen a school. This is Sidney Pet we are talking about in the 1970s. Really no space for education or even interaction with modern institutions, with courts, except the force of the law, which is the police. And that half-naked shepherd says, Yes, he did stab the, um, the money vendor, but then what are the courts for? And Kannabiran remarks that, that this, this, this very, what we call illiterate shepherd, engagement with state institutions or engagement with his own ethical system or the very ideas of modern democracy was found in that shepherd who has never really interacted with uh, modern institutions, like in the cities or not. He already had the sense that the rule of law is the rule of law. That no matter who does what, what are the courts for? And Kanabran remarks that this was such a refreshing experience. And he said that, okay, after that, they, the villages became became fine and uh, they must have deposed in the Parkour Commission. And he returned to Hyderabad. And next day, he went. He goes to court. And as soon as he enters the court premises at Nampalli he, or, or somewhere, uh, there, are, there are five young lawyers who came to him and, he, and asked him that Kanabiran, because Kanabiran was, um, was a defense lawyer in many of the encounter cases and in many of the cases of torture, uh, who were allegedly Naxals, these young lawyers asked him that, how can, uh, you know, Kanabiran, how can you protect these people? These people who don't believe in the constitution, how can you afford them the protection given by the constitutional principles? Why in court are you defending them? And Kanabiran reminded them that whenever a person is coming to be tried in our court, it is our principles that are on trial of what we believe and not what they believe. And he said, this is something that that illiterate naked shepherd knew and your parents have wasted a lot of money in your education because you seem to have learned nothing well that's him it is just an incident to to sort of illustrate what is it uh, that i'm trying to say terrorists or nobody have has the right to kill anybody for terrorists with the same sentiment that this question was asked this is the same sentiment by which the executive make anti-terrorism laws. And as we already know, that anti-terrorism laws do this. They, 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 they sort of allow extrajudicial killing and torture. So, okay, that's happening there. But world over, throughout the second, post the Second World War, when these nation states came up, including India, everybody knew that states can kill much more than what citizens can. And it is precisely for that reason that the Human Rights Act, there was a series of legislations that were coming from the global, the global humanity saying that states cannot just take all power. They cannot kill. Like terrorists cannot kill, states cannot kill. And states have been killing, whether through genocides, whether through just everyday practice, whether through crimes against humanity, or in any other way they've been doing this for a long time. Which is why this whole human rights mechanisms came in. So according, so there was a resolution that all countries had to accept and which is why the Human Rights Act in our country was adopted. And on that basis, the National Human Rights Commission came in. But compare the National Human Rights Commission to an anti-terror law. The anti-terror law came for terrorists who were killing. 
the National Human Rights Commission or the Human Rights Act came for the state who was also killing in certain areas in certain times. But the state was, um, the NHRC, the National Human Rights Commission was a toothless body. It could only document state crimes. There is a huge disparity here, which is what also Kanabiran points out, that where that the body which has massive capacities for violence, which has always deployed violence, which also has capacity for structural violence, what we have for that is a very small documenting body called the National Human Rights Commission. But for the few terrorists who have threatened us, we have massive legal systems and massive flow of power. We have extraordinary sites, jurisdictions like Guantanamo Bay or the Guantanamo Bay is just an example. Every country now has these sites of exception where torture can go on. So ultimately, it boils down to our ethical principles, how we are able to see things, how we are able to not see it. I believe that killing is wrong. And even if killing is not entirely wrong, any society which uses so much of violence to sustain itself is not a good society. There is another argument in, in some of these ethical argumentations, like the argument of death penalty, that even though there is a huge debate within the judicial jurisprudential debate on death penalty, whether states have the right to take life or not judicially, studies across death penalty situations, across jurisdictions have found out that when it comes to the administration of death penalty, it is largely the poor and the underprivileged who bear the brunt of it. Because we are not just all equal. Birsa Munda was not equal to a Ram Mohan Roy who was living in Calcutta. In no way was he equal. We have in India the caste system, the class system, the religion system, the ethnic system, the regional system, whatever, all kinds of systems that constitutes us differentially as citizens. And whenever these principles are allowed, so for example, if you say that, okay, terrorism, in the situation of terrorism, you can allow states to kill, look at who is dying. So it doesn't just remain a principle, okay, people who will threaten us will be killed. It becomes a matter of practice, because not all who threaten us are killed. Only those who can be are killed. And this is what is happening in our country right now. From a legal point of view, if you look at what is a genocide, a genocide is the finishing off, is the extermination of a specific group of people. That's the legal definition. In order to prove that genocide is happening in a country, for example, what happened in Rwanda or what happened, uh, let's say, in, in Nazi Germany, where a specific group of people are constructed, whether it's the Tutsis or the, the Jews, if you construct them as bad people, as dangerous people, as absolutely shit people, and you say, okay, we're going to finish them off, that is genocide. Of course, you finish them off using extrajudicial killing, using uh, torture, using many other methods. Similarly, what is crimes against humanity? Crimes against humanity is the use of torture, is the use of extrajudicial killing at a large systematic scale in peace situations. So at the end of this, I would say, um, and we can take questions maybe now, that how we look at Birsa Munda, and I'm so glad that you all invited me for this. Um, I'm honored to be uh, speaking when Birsa Munda is being commem commemorated. Because one doesn't need to be a very fancy human rights activist to be respected or to be recognized. Because recognition also comes from within. I would see Birsa Munda as the principal human rights defender, if there is one.
today. Because what he was resisting is his instrumentalization, is his subjection to forms of rule that he disagreed to. You, many of us can say what is right or what is wrong and this is not legal and that is not legal. But the fact remains that we have to listen to the voice of our conscience. We have to listen and we have to cultivate the voice that tells us good things. That tells us that to murder is not good. That tells us that violence, whether of mental kinds or of physical kinds, is not good. The basic human voice that tells us that laughter is better than a cry of pain. So, yeah, I missed out. Um, I missed out one thing is that now this situation, of course, whatever I have said doesn't give you any pathways into what to do. But especially in situations of torture and extrajudicial killing, because we don't recognize those crimes, and it's very easy for the state, for legal system to actually blame the very victim for the extrajudicial killing, as we see in many states across the history. It will be very difficult to prosecute because you will never get permission. But the only way is documentation. Because when we are documenting, we are recording the voice of those who have been killed and those who have killed forever. And you send it to the State Human Rights Commission, you send it to wherever you want to send it, you make you make a human cry about it because it is not acceptable. To kill is not acceptable in the same way that we are making a human cry about terrorist killing. Of course, they cannot do that. Similarly, the state cannot do that either. And I would just like to say that the National Human Rights Commission collects these when you, you, you file a complaint. It's a very easy form. It's a letter that this has happened. You document it. You make the evidence and you file a complaint. And the Human Rights Commission is forced to record it. And this is then shared with the parliament. And this is also shared in court cases. So even though we do not have a legal category, in what ways do we say that we are being killed? This is some of the principal ways. I would say documentation, alertness in terms of having our narratives on the ground. And I'd like to end with what Congressman um, Lewis or whatever his name is, the equivalent of Gandhi, and he said that in George Floyd protest that we, he was referring to the blacks, that we were better than the underfunded schools that you put us into. That we were more capable of doing all the good things that we, that anybody does if you wouldn't have your knee on our necks and if you would let us breathe because having a knee on our neck and not being able to breathe is the particular predicament of all underprivileged poor people across the world and i would say that birsa was a representative of them thank you So you could share the written question with me if I can see them and I can just answer. Um, I can just pick up. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, okay. What is next? Next one is by Ahmed Arslan. He's asking, when could a migrant labor come to torture the innocent region within one of us? Um, can you please repeat it? What are the? What are the affecting factors that are not reported for submitting death or torture? 
Okay, I didn't I didn't get the final question. Affecting factors for not recording. I didn't get that. Lack of manipulation. Lack of manipulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. I found this question. What are the affecting factors that not recording or submitting death or torture? I would say that if you could ask your question in Hindi, I think you've translated it in your head um, and which is why I'm not able to understand what you're really asking. Maybe in Hindi it would be easier. Similarly with this question, uh, lack of uh, manipulation, I'm not entirely getting it. But I will try and answer what I think I understood. Um, see, the police is the force of the law in many ways. But the police are also pulled from ourselves. The lower constabulary, as you would know, is just like any other uneducated um, or let me say any other person who did not receive, um, did not have the privilege to educate themselves very nicely, uh, but had to struggle for survival. A lower constabulary is just that. They're, and they get promoted and whatever, whatever. And then there is the elite section of IPS officers who get selected through examinations and this and that. Of course, in all of this, caste comes in, as you must, must be all knowing. Indian society is principally a caste-based society, where we say, okay, certain kind of people who are born in a certain way have these, and whatever. There's a theological idea and there's a practical idea. The theology, when practiced across 10,000 of years, makes a certain situation. So of course, in India, this idea that there are certain people who are bad or who are dirty, caste system, the very principle of um, some of the some of the genesis of the ideas is impurity and pollution. That some people are dirty, some people are bad, and then there is not much of, you know, from dirty and bad, there is not much of a flying distance to terrorist and anti-national and whatever, whatever. So, the very social order is constituted by caste. If you see in villages who lives where, you look at the, at the geography, at the arrangement of space. So, um, custodial deaths, which is why if you see who are killed by the police and who are tortured and who die in police custody, either they are dying by torture or the state is saying that they die by suicide or hunger or whatever. Who are the people who are most have the conditions to fall in this. It's largely the poor, lower caste um, people or tribal people or some other people. But, of course, the police, I mean, if you look at the lower constabulary or people who do actually torture, even the higher ones, how much do they know about the criminal justice system? How much do they know about these principles of... Uh, of how to treat what is the idea of rights because they have never been treated in the same way as well. So I wouldn't blame the police entirely. The police represent our own very worst faces. Now, is the death of a migrant labor an extrajudicial killing? I would say it's a murder. It's state murder. And of course, it could be extrajudicial because the state created I am in Switzerland and I've also gone through lockdown and not a single person died. Nowhere has a single person died. The lockdown was planned. The lockdown took into account that there are massive data gathering systems, that we are sitting at a massive steel structure of administration, 
that we are sitting at a complete governance which is extremely populated by so many different calculations. And of course, a lockdown is planned keeping in mind this calculation. We know the movement of labor. Entire India is dependent on the movement of labor for its, for everything, for its extractive relationship that I've been talking about. When you build these factories, when you build these uh, whatever it is that you want to make so much of money out of from, who will work there? You've got to convert indigenous people. You've got to convert people who had land before. You've got to convert them into labor. What is the difference between a sovereign, a person, a citizen and a labor? A labor is principally just an instrument for work. So, of course, if you create the structural conditions, you knew there was so much of labor. Everybody's been earning so much of money based on that labor. And where is the money going? Not going to the labor. If you look at him, it will be clearly visible that all that money is not going to his stomach or his children. So, of course, the state created the conditions. It absolute. It is absolute murder. Thank you. But I am not concerned with China. I am only concerned with China to the extent that we are becoming China. I am a citizen of this world and I would condemn what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989. And of course the present government does not talk about it because the present government is not really in the Chinese government is a different kind of government. It's more of a one party left monarchy system which I am equally opposed to. So, uh, in the similar way that the Chinese government denies Tiananmen Square, the Indian government <laughs> denies all these squares, whether it's, I mean, what is Shahin Bagh if not a square? And what is Jantar Mantar before that if not a square? And every state, every place has its squares. And the very existence of our systems right now is dependent on their denials of the existence of these squares and the demands that people have been making in these squares. Tiananmen Square became such a huge thing because there was this photo of a man standing in front of a tank. That is pure sovereignty. That is a man who has not been instrumentalized towards anything. And all our education of law or all our education as human beings is to just become that while knowing the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that you invited me. Thank you.